Is there a place for the dead called hell? Does hell exist now? Will hell be an eternal fire? Can a person who will be in hell talk to the saved? Is there a purgatory, a place between heaven and hell? What does the Bible say about hell? Join us and listen the answer to this question and others at the conference The Real Hell at the series The Future World. It is a pleasure for me to share one more topic and today topic number 11 of this series, The Future World, from uh, Washington DC in United States, who is speaking is Pastor Pablo Hanger, and today with the title, The Real Hell. Year 2020, it had been a year with full of mega fire. These mega fires are record fires, big fires, and are considered mega fires because of the extension of these fires. At least a million acres are considered a gigafire. There are several gigafires in this year 2020. CNN uh, wrote an article, the California fire is not considered a gigafire. But another article, BBC, it says, unprecedented hellfire involved America West Coast. <laughs> Interesting. They are considered this fire a hellfire and is mentioned there in the article, the Western US has recently experienced serious heat waves, including a day that leads to what could be the highest temperature, even reliable recorded on the planet, 54.4 centigrade, also reported in California. But another article from uh, one, uh, it is also from the CNN, it was the title, the UN warns that these world risks are becoming uninhabitable hell for millions unless leaders take climate action. Here we see that this world can become a hell, but is really this the hell that is talking in the Bible? And the article mentioned that between the year 2000 and 2018, there were 7,348 major natural disasters, including earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes. This claimed 1.23 million lives, affecting 4.2 billion people. And with the economical global, uh, global economic loss of approximately 3 trillion, as stated in the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk and Reduction. Here we see terrible. And the statistic from previous years, eh, it is not half of what had happened in these last 20 years. Also, eh, in this, on, until October 1st, it is mentioned that here in the United States, more than 44,000 wild fire had been recorded and 7.7 .7 million acres had been destroyed. This is incredible. But not just in the United States, Australia, in the beginning of 2020, also was affected by huge fires. It says the article that by middle of March, there were approximately 18.6 million hectares uh, being burned. It's approximately 46 million acres or 186,000 square kilometers. These are big areas were destroyed 5,900 buildings, including circa, circa 3,000 homes, and killing circa 40 people. We see this has been terrible destruction. Many people during these fires experienced terrible moment of despair, seeing that the fires is coming closer. Some of them managed miracles to be away from this run, flee in time from these fires. But others, it had been terrible to see in the news people that were caught in the fire in the cars and they were burned alive in the cars. We can ignore that this, the risk of Earth's temperatures. We can ignore that every year there are more catastrophe fires. But are all these really the hell that is speaking in the Bible? I want to go to another area. They are even among Christians, 
especially in the Catholic Christian, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in the Article 12, it teach about hell. And in the point number 1035, it says the teaching of the uh, Church affirmed the existence of hell and its eternity. The souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell immediately after death, and there they suffer the sorrow of hell. This is the eternal fire. This is the article I'm reading from the Catechism, the, Cat the Catholic Catechism, the article 12, in the point number 1035. But they also speak about another uh, belief, it is the belief of the purgatory. In the same article 12, this is in the point number 1030. It says there, those who die in the grace and friendship of God, but imperfectly purified, those sure of the eternal salvation suffer after their death a purification in order to obtain the holiness necessary to enter in the joy of heaven. This is a middle point. They believe a place between heaven and hell that is also fire, but necessary for purification. That means that they are suffering the fire there, but they manage to, to leave the fire and finally reach heaven. But there is no Bible text, there is no ref reference of the Bible there. The Bible in no place speak about this um, purgatory, this belief of the, this theory of the purgatory. But does the Bible speak about eternal fire? Yes. The Bible speak about eternal fire. Jesus and the apostles spoke about death. But I want to remind you what we spoke previous days. Jesus and the apostles spoke the dead as a state of sleeping, being in a sleep. And in this state of sleep, we also read that there is no conscience, that there is no knowledge. But let's read today other texts. Matthew 5, 22, it says there, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in dangers of the cancer. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in dangers of hell fire. Here we see the Bible speak about hell. But the question is, when is this hell going to happen? Is there already a place that is called hell? Let's go to the book. That is the major book that we are studying in this series, The Future World, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation in the chapter 21, when it's speaking about the last events and it's talking about new heaven new new earth just in the future the end it says there in revelation chapter 21 verse number eight put attention but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and wormongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Oh, just a moment. When is then the second death? What is he talking about here? Why, why do we mention here the second death? Normally when the people die, they are dying in the first death. But here is mentioned the second death. We are going to clarify why is mentioned this. The book of Revelation is very clear in the events of the last days. When we go to the book, the Revelation chapter 19, there we already saw in past conference in this series, The Future World, that Jesus Christ is coming and is coming as a king, but is coming also as a judge. And we saw that when Jesus will come, what will happen in the second coming? Those that believe in Christ, they resurrect with the Lord and they are going to meet Jesus on the earth and go with Jesus in the second coming. In the conference uh, yesterday the, about the judgment, we saw that during, after the second coming of Jesus will be a period of thousand years. This earth will be desolated because at the coming of Jesus, all the wicked will die. And during this thousand year, it will be a period of judgment. But after the thousand year, what will happen after the thousand year? Let's go back and let's read this and review this in Revelation chapter 20. It's very important to be clear in these last events. Revelation chapter 20, 
It says there, verse number one, we review number one and two. It says, and I saw an angel came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Verse number two, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. This is what happened after Jesus go with the saints to heaven. Verse number five now. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Here we see the first resurrection is when Jesus comes, the same one. But after the thousand years, there is now another resurrection of those that remain, that were dead when Jesus came, that die when the wicked do not resurrect when Jesus come. And now let's continue reading, verse number seven until nine. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nation which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is uh, as the sun of the sea. And they went up on the bread, uh, bread of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and destroyed them. Here we see it's talking people that are alive these days. And it's mentioned that they want to destroy the city, surround the city, and come fire from God and destroy them. And here we see clearly, when is this fire coming and destroying them? After the thousand years, they resurrect. Satan again is loose from this prison. We mentioned it's not the real prison because Satan cannot be bound with chain, but was prison of circumstances. The wicked are already again there because they are resurrected. And then he gathered, deceived them. Let's get the city. Let's conquer the city. Let's destroy the saints. And then come the final judgment of the wicked. Yes, after here we see that after this thousand years is the destruction. Then there is no hell today because this will contradict here what is written in Revelation. And they will contradict that the... Um, when Jesus will come, the saints will be resurrected to go to heaven. This will be the moment that the, the saved will go to heaven when Jesus comes. There is no heaven today for those that die. There is also no hell today, and neither is a purgatory, a middle place. There is not the purgatory. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10. It says, And the devil that received them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Here we see the destruction, the destruction forever and ever. But what is this destruction forever and ever? It's really a fire that will never end. And <laughs> will the fire surround the new Jerusalem? This is the picture that we see, that they are wicked, are surrounding the city, that come fire from heaven and destroy them. Will is the meaning of that that the fire will surround the city for forever and ever? I want to point to you that we may understand this expression to the book of Jude. Jude is a small book just before Revelation. And there, verse number seven, say, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over the fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What? Where is the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah? Here it says the Bible, the eternal fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. If we say that it's literal, the eternal fire, when Jesus comes, that will be the same with Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was also destroyed with a fire brainstorm. It's the same. And then we will find the fire in any place in this earth. We don't have that. Let's see also Luke. Jesus also mentioned about this. Luke chapter 17, verse 29. It says there, But the same day that Lord went out of Sodom, it drained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Here we see also Jesus is quoting that it's not that they go in a hell, in a place where it's fire, but 
Here it says, Sodom was destroyed by fire that came from heaven and destroyed them. Similar is the case here. It's not that this is eternal fire. What is trying to refer here? What has remained from Sodom and Gomorrah? Archaeologists, they are trying to find where is Sodom and Gomorrah and they have not found until now. They will never find. Why? Because they were destroyed totally, complete. And this is what is referring here. What is going to be destroyed? The sin, the wickedness. And the wicked will be destroyed forever. They will remain nothing. In those fires that we have in California, sometimes you see areas that they are not ashes and there's nothing. No, the trees are there. They are burned, but the, the, the stamps are still there. Burned stamps, but they are still there. Here is trying to show us that the destruction will be complete. Genesis chapter 18, Verse number 20, Genesis 18, 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Why they were the city destroyed? Because of the wickedness, because of the sin. And we are living today in days that the earth is corrupted like Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Peter it's mentioned that in the second letter of Peter, second Peter, the Bible, we find an appeal. It says they are the following, second Peter 2, 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after shall live ungodly. It is showing us that if we live separated from God, we will suffer the same destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah that remain nothing. They had found only some valleys in the Israel area uh, that is a lot of quantity of brainstorm, but it's every, everything that they had found. In the book of Revelation, let's continue reading chapter 20 to see the real destruction. What else is mentioned there? Revelation chapter 20. Verse number 12 to 15 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the decks were judged, the deaths were judged, out of those things which were written in the books, according to the works. This is what we saw in the previous conference, that in this thousand years is a judgment. Here is judgment, but it's judgment based on the books, the record of the person. Verse number 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and deaths and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to the words. In this version, it says, and the dead and hell. Other version says, the dead and the grave deliver up the deaths. It's an expression here. Verse number 14 and 15, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Other versions say here, and death and uh, the graves were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the books of life was cast into the lake of fire. This will be the real hell when they are going to destroy. This, some version, they have this kind of expression that confuse, but the hell is the destruction, is the final destruction after the thousand year. In this text, we see that during the thousand year, the judgment, we see that death will give the deaths back, the resurrection. And point number three, deaths and Hades or the sepulchre, as is also mentioned in another version, it says the sepulchre or the uh, grave or the Hades is thrown into the lake of fire. But how can we throw deaths in the fire? Death is an expression, it's not a person. Here is mentioned something very important. Death will be destroyed forever. That's why Revelation 12, chapter 21, that is the chapter that followed, the chapter that we are studying 20, in verse number, um, here we see in verse number 4, And God shall weep away the tears from the eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And this is what will happen. God will destroy death forever. There will be no more death. 
Don't miss the topic of tomorrow. We are going to talk about this new home, the precious, the joyful place that we will have when Jesus will come with the new Jerusalem, this beautiful place that God will give to those that will be saved. But I want to, before we uh, finish, bring another, another experience. And this is one that I want to bring up for clarification because it brings confusion to many people. Look, chapter 16, there is a story that was uh, referred by Jesus. And uh, there from verse number 22 to 31, it says the following. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he left up his eyes, being in torment, and seed Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And said Lazarus that he may dip this, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this fire. Strange. One trying to ask the other, come and help me with a little bit of water. But Abraham, verse number 25, said, Son, remember that thou was Thou in the lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Number 26 now, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they uh, which pass, which will pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from thence. Then he say, Oh, pray. Thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses, and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Did you put attention in the last text? It's talking about raising from the dead and trying to convince one that is raising from the dead. Interesting. Why is Jesus telling this story? In the Talmud, the Talmud and the records of some beliefs of the Jews is not registered in the, in the Bible. There is a story of the rich Mahan. It was a tax collector. And also compared in this story is mentioned a poor young student. And it's good possible that Jesus knew these stories that were among the Israelites that was going around. And in these stories, I'm quoting from the Talmud. It says, one of the student's friends had a dream in which he saw the fate of the two souls after their death. The student was in paradise, the garden of the king, enjoying its beauty and the richness of the vegetation and the streams. The man who had been rich in his life, Majan was also standing on the banks of the stream, trying to reach the water, but unable to do so. You see here, interesting, in this Talmud, is referring a story very similar to the one that Jesus was sharing. In other, in other words, I believe Jesus was referring to something very similar and trying to tell them a lesson. But what was the lesson? First, according to this, what do we see in this story? According with this narrative, Lazarus is seen taking to Abraham, talking to Abraham uh, when he is dead. But the dead can speak, say the Bible, Ecclesiastes. And Jesus is not contradicting what Ecclesiastes says. Jesus is just referring to them something that they used to believe. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, For those who live know that they are to die, but the dead know nothing, nor they have more reward, for the memory is forgotten. How can he speak if he is dead? Second, as it is seen here, hell is near to heaven, so that they can uh, hold the conversation. This is not realistic. Neither the Christians believe this today. Those that believe in hell, they don't believe that there is ways to communicate between heaven, hell and, and, and heaven. And the third one, the answer to this illustration is in the last verse of the same chapter. There 
In verse number 31, it says, And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they persuade those ones rise from death. A person must make decision while he is alive. Because after that, there is no chance, no chance that no longer to take any change in their decisions. Jesus used allegories on parables in his message. And these are some of these illustrations that were in the mind of the people. And he is trying to tell them, you need to decide as long as you live, because after you die, there is no options. There is another interesting example that I want to see, show you that Jesus is illustrating something, but this is an allegory. It's not a, it's just trying to show an illustration. Look at here in Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, verse number eight and nine. It says there, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot oft, uh, offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better from thee to enter in the life, halt or uh, maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eyes offend thee, pluck it out and cut this from thee. It is better from thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. What does this mean? Should we then take our eyes or cut our leg, cut our hands? No, it's not referring to that. It's trying to see that sometimes in order to be saved, we need to take strong decisions that we not allow our eyes to be seeing things, watching things that will destroy, that I need to take a firm decision, better suffering, not watching something that maybe I still have joy in my flesh to see, maybe in morality or maybe in um, um, violence that people watch in the TV and you need to be firm. You cannot mix yourself with your feelings. Say, I look that way. I wish that, you know, it's trying to tell very clearly whether you remove your eyes, whether you stop watching those things or your hand or your leg doing things. Better you don't do that than lose the eternal life. Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. With God's help and power, we can overcome evil. The same power, the work and miracles, save the children can also work today. The same power that Jesus used for when he did wonderful miracles can also work miracles for you today. This is an interesting story that I'd like to refer in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel, chapter 3. He mentioned a story in the time of the king Nebuchadnezzar. And I want to read there from verse number 13 to 19. Put attention to this story. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, that they brought, uh, then they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, This is true, O Sadrach, Mesa, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? No, if ye be ready that at the time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, shakbat, uh, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall down. You sh uh, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well, but ye worship not. Ye shall be cast the same hours into the midst of the burning fire furnace. Uh, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Sadrach, Mesa, and Abednego answer and say to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and uh, he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, bid now unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship thy golden image, which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, 
And the form of his visage was changed against Satrach, Mesa, and Abednego. Therefore, he spoke and commands that they should uh, hit the furnace one seven times more than it was once to be heated. Terrible. This was a strong fire. It was already hot seven times more. And what happened in this story? These three men, they didn't want to worship this image. They didn't want to obey this king that was requesting them to do things wrong. And they knew according with the word of God that they should not worship anyone, neither an image, neither a king. But what happened in the story? Let's continue reading verse number 22 and 23. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. And these three men, Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, fall down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. <laughs> they went thrown into the, the fire. Verse number 25 to 27. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the ferning, fiery furnace and spoke and said, Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, ye servant of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. He did that. Then Sadrach, Mesach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the prince, governor, and captains, and the king counselor being gathered together saw these men. Upon those bodies, the fire had no power, no was a hair of the, their heads singer, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. What an amazing story! How could it be throwing the fire and they were not burned? Something happened here. Who was the four that was like the Son of God? That was Jesus. In this story, we find five interesting parts. God having power over fire. Yes, God had power over the fire. He can send fire, but he had power over the fire. Second, a king asking for a false worship. We have seen in the last days that the world said there is a power in this world that is requesting a false worship. Mixing things of God on this king of God, he knew about God, but he is now requesting to worship him. It seems that even Christians today, they are thinking that they're worshiping God, but God does not accept the worship of any image. This even in the commandment, second commandment, forbid the worship of images. But similar will happen in the last days. There is a power against God called the Antichrist. We already identify this power. And it's also mixed with what we mentioned today. The Catechism is bringing the ideas that this confusion is not in the Bible. There is no today hell. But there will be a destruction after the thousand years, after this, this, the first the resurrection of the, the second group, these are the wicked, and then will be the second death, and then will be the fire in the second death. Number three, faithful children of God trusting in the power of God as they do not worship the image or obey the erroneous order of the king, and they receive this miracle. Strong men, number four, strong men die by the power of the fire. This captain, the strong men die, but the three men, they did not die. The strong men did not enter in the fire, they die outside. The three men, they were inside, but they did not die. Number five, God manifests his power and saves his faithful children. The same will happen in the last days. If we are faithful to God, there is no fire that will destroy us. But for those in the second death, there is nothing that can save them anymore. After the death, the grace end, there is no way to change. That's why before Jesus come, everything needs to be desired. The Bible says in Hebron 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes, God is a consuming fire. And he will destroy the wicked, destroy the sin, destroy the bad things forever. And will give us a beautiful home for those that believe in him and are faithful to him. 
One more text in Matthew chapter 25. I want to read there, verse number 34 first. It says there, Then shall the king say unto them out on his right hand, Come, ye blessed on my father. He nearly the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse number 41. Then shall the, he say also unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye curse unto everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angel. Number 46. And this shall go away unto everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Wonderful. There is a place prepared for the righteous, for those that are the right, that believe in the Lord. And today is a time to rescue your soul. Today is the time. That's why this rescue project prepared this city, the future world, to see the dangers that we are facing. And soon is the end. Soon finish the grace. And today is time for decision, my dear friend. Let's depart from evil. Let's depart from lies. Let's depart from fornication. Depart from all kind of sin. And let's worship God in truth, according with the word of God. Not as men requires to mix things from God or not from God. No, let's do what is right in the sight of God, that we may save our life and be with the Lord forever. My dear friend, may the Lord help us that in the great day of God, we may be prepared to meet Him in the clouds. I'd invite you to bow your faces and to pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we have seen many things during this series. We have seen that one day come this fire that will destroy everything, will remain nothing. There is no more opportunity. Lord, soon you will come. And there is only one group that will be saved. They are those that believe in you and they are faithful to you. We want to be in this group, Lord. Even if they die, you will resurrect the group there in the second coming and take with you for the heaven. But there is another group after the thousand years that will resurrect for destruction and will die the second death, will die in this fire from heaven and brimstone. Lord, we don't want to be there. Help us, Lord, to be, to love you and to Lord, stick to you, to take your word and read your word. And Lord, be transformed by your power, by your grace. Lord, forgive our friends if they have done wrong. And help us, Lord, to be in your ways, to study your truth, and to prepare for this wonderful future that you had for your children. Lord, we ask all this, not because we have merits, but we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Dear friend, I hope you enjoyed the topic and was a clarity for you, but I invite you for tomorrow. Tomorrow you are going to study a home prepared for you, a blessed, a wonderful place. Don't lose the topic of tomorrow. May God bless you.